So um, uh, it just seems like every week something new in the news, and I thought I'd just give you a quick news recap. So my hope in doing this is to try and help you have what I refer to as a Christian perspective on things. Stuff happens every week. It's just not slowing down. So first of all, I just want to say, um, I guess it's a good thing. I don't know, but you're all still here, and the blood moon happened on Monday night. Like I woke up Tuesday and Roxana was still here, Paul was still here, so I'm thinking, whoo, good thing, I didn't miss it, you know. So if you're not up on the blood moon thing, you didn't miss anything. Uh, I will say this, we have now two real, real clear, what I would refer to as false prophets. You ought to stay away from this guy, John Hagee. I mean, I cannot believe people still follow him. He qualifies for a false prophet and made a big hubbub about these blood moons bringing the end of time and, you know, very careful in his wording, but making sure he sold a lot of books and got people all hyped up and nothing happened. And Mark Blintz is the other guy. You know, stay away from them. Literally, stay away from them. I, I, I just can't make it any more clear. There's such a thing as a false prophet. He is a false prophet. Got it? Don't miss that, okay? If you have trouble with that, read up on it, all right? Uh, nothing wrong with saying... This, the coming of the Lord is near. I mean, Paul believed in that in, in writing the scriptures. The coming of the Lord is near, and his timing is not our timing, and we have to live every day as though it could happen today. I mean, that's reality. So I'm all right with saying, hey, the coming of the Lord is near, but I'm not all right with people making these false predictions that are just not true. And so that's what he did. Got a lot of publicity. Happened Monday night. Nothing happened. And uh, I think he's a false prophet, so hopefully that helps you, and if you have his book, you might want to toss it, okay? All right, so, uh, and then, uh, so if you didn't keep up on the news this week, oh my gosh, we had all kinds of uh, bickering going on in our Congress, the Senate and the House, and if you didn't catch this, the budget had to be passed by Thursday, or the government was going to shut down, but... There was this strong group of what I would refer to conservative Christians in the House who were holding out, said we will not pass this unless they defund Planned Parenthood, and then somehow they struck a secret deal in our great Republican House and great Republican Senate, went ahead and passed the budget anyway. Gave that half billion dollars back to Planned Parenthood. They wrote some caveat in there, well, we'll look at it again in December. Really? You think they're going to change it in December? I'm just so, I'm, I, it's just horrible. Horrible. And, uh, you know, it, it, it makes me say to you, uh, it is frustrating. You know, it is very frustrating. But rather than just saying, you know, shaking your head and wringing your hands and saying, what can I do? You know, there are things you can do. A phone call to your senator a phone call to your House of Representatives, uh, that the representative for your district, and letting them know if they voted for that budget, you will not vote for them again, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. They're giving money to Planned Parenthood, who is using the money to kill babies, and then now to sell their parts on the open market. Do not be deceived into thinking they're offering services to women. What they offer, they charge for. What they offer, they don't even provide in their clinics. They send people out. For the 300 or 700 total clinics that there are, Planned Parenthood, there's 13,000 family clinics in the U.S. that are offering most of their services free. We don't need Planned Parenthood, but even if they want to exist, that's fine. They do not need half a billion dollars from the federal government. It's an atrocious, it's, it, it's horrendous. But do something, okay? So here's another suggestion. Not only call your representatives, how about thinking about the picket coming up this Saturday? This is the second nationwide picket. There was one in August. Almost 80,000 people around the country participated. Over 300 Planned Parenthood centers were picketed. This is a peaceful picket. It's a legal protest. We're not breaking the law. This is not civil disobedience. It's just an opportunity to get out and say, I, I just need to do something. And I can tell you that if we got maybe 100,000 at this one, and then maybe the next one we got a quarter of a million, and then maybe the next one we got a million, I have a funny feeling that something would happen. But if no one shows up, oh, well, yeah, they're, you know, what do you expect? No one's doing anything. Everybody's shaking their heads and wishing somebody would do something. So 
this Saturday, two hours, 9 o'clock to 11. The one we'll be at will be down on Main Street. Come on out. It's prayerful. Is it going to change things immediately? I don't know, but I can tell you I sleep better than I'm doing something. I call my senator. I call my representative. I let them know. I also will go to this picket, and hopefully there'll be a thousand at our center, and there'll be a hundred thousand in the U.S. And maybe, maybe we can stop this horrible crime that's going on in our country. So, end of that story. That the budget was passed, but then we have another one. So that's Wednesday, Thursday. Then, then Thursday we've got the shooting at the Oregon University. Unbelievable! Another nine innocent people shot. I forget how many wounded, seven. I mean, this is, this is unbelievable what's going on in our country. And for those of you that, that really believe stricter gun control is going to stop this, you are incredibly wrong. It will not. It will not. I mean, you know, common sense ought to rule here, but I think I read this from Will Rogers years ago. He used to write editorials, and one of his editorials, he said one time, I'm afraid to say... Common sense ain't so common anymore. I mean, come on, strict gun control. Well, first of all, that university had the strictest gun control of all. It was a gun-free zone. There's your gun control. No one was allowed to have weapons on the campus. I mean, gun control is only for law-abiding citizens to take their weapons away so that criminals can carry guns and do horrendous things to people. This is, this is outrageous what's going on here. And then, though, the whole thought, what is happening to our country? You know, I looked up on the web. There is actually a site. It's called uh, the Mass Shooting Tracker. And they have tracked every mass shooting in the U.S. since January 1, 297 public mass shootings. 297. We've only had, as of Thursday, we've only had 274 days in the calendar year. We've had 297 shootings in 274 days. 400 innocent people like this shot and killed somewhere close to double that wounded. It's unbelievable what's happening. And so, you know, what's the cause? Well, I, again, I do not believe stricter gun control is going to do anything. We have a moral issue in our country. I mean, we have a, we have a broken society we have what I would call a theophobic society. Everybody likes to put phobic at the end of everything that you oppose. But we have a theophobic society. You can't talk about God at school. You can't talk about God at work. You can't talk about God in public places. I mean, that's theophobic. And when you have a culture that falls away from God and then the devaluing of life, this is the kind of stuff that happens. And really, what's the answer? I think the answer is we need to pray to God that his Holy Spirit would move through this country and awaken his people and awaken his church. That, that's the only hope, that God's people will speak up and declare truth about the value of human life and following the laws of God. And so, uh, actually, that kind of leads me into this morning's sermon. All right, so there's your news recap. Hopefully, next week you don't need one. Hopefully it's a normal week. You know, the weather was good and the Buckeyes won. That's good enough for me, all right? I don't need any more news. But it leads me into this morning's sermon. And what I want to talk about this morning, this is so important. I want to help you how to have beautiful feet. Some of you just got whiplash. You just got whiplash. Like, he had me and then now he doesn't. What the heck is he talking about? Well, actually, I read surveys and, and uh, research, and apparently most people don't think they have beautiful feet. Like, you know, if I had all of you bow your heads and I just sat <laughs> in, you see, you know, how, many of you, how many of you think you have beautiful, you know, like most Americans at least don't think they have beautiful feet. But what does this have to do with today's sermon? A lot, all right? So let's jump right into this. If you have your Bibles, look in Romans chapter 10. Tell you what beautiful feet have to do with God awakening his church and the need for a revival. Romans chapter 10, Paul is writing, starting in verse 13, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that's important. 
But then he asks, well, how then shall they call on him on whom they have not believed? How are they going to get saved? How shall they believe in him and whom they have not heard? How are they going to hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, you ready? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and who bring glad tidings of good things. Is it important to have beautiful feet? Everybody look down at your feet. Who's this talking about? Like you read this, you say, well, we know you have to call on the name of the Lord to be saved, and, and in order for people to be saved, someone has to tell them about the ways of God. But when you read this, you think, well, he's talking about preachers because he says, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they're sent? So we're thinking, oh, preachers are supposed to have beautiful feet. Well, I do have beautiful feet. In the spirit realm, actually. <laughs> I think it's more than preachers, though. I'm pretty sure this is not just referring to, like, pastor of a church. Or you might read this and think, well, you know, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they're sent? Maybe you're thinking, well, he's, if he's not talking about a pastor, or maybe he's not talking about a preacher, maybe he's talking about those special people who have that special gift of... Uh, evangelism and and so then we think well that doesn't really apply to me well it, it, I'm pretty sure if you read the Gospels Jesus said to all of his followers if you're a disciple he said go into all the world tell people about what I've taught you baptize them bring them into the kingdom and I'm pretty sure that that we're all called to preach the gospel or to bring good news or glad tidings and, and what I'm feeling this morning, now maybe some of you can relate to this, but I am really feeling a stirring in my spirit. I, I'm not exactly sure. I just, I shared with you a couple weeks ago, it's like, you know, a midlife crisis, a little too late in my life, I'm not sure. But I just feel a stirring. And, and I'm thinking maybe God's stirring some of you, but I, I feel like God's trying to do something here among us as a church. And maybe it's not just our church. Maybe it's the church in America is it possible God's trying to wake up his church and to say, listen, there are a lot of people out there who are broken and lost who, who would call on the name of the Lord and would be saved, but they can't because no one's walking them through the process. No one's talking to them. I, I believe God wants to challenge us as a church, and I, I believe this is a challenge to all the churches in America. Let's look out for our neighbor and consider the possibility that maybe they're struggling and they need God in their life. Now I know anytime I talk about this topic of sharing your faith or evangelism, most Christians just sort of shut down. You know, it's like, we know we should, we would like to, but I don't know how, and I feel weird, and I'm not sure I can do it right, and it's difficult, and I don't want to come across, you know, pushing my faith, and I don't even know if it's legal. I mean, anymore you wonder. Can, and so there's all this resistance. But, but this morning I want to talk about this because, and actually for the next several weeks, because I, I believe, you know, I, I was listening to something last night. I forget who the guy was. It was a radio program, and it was called uh, Conspiracy Saturday or something, or, you know, Conspiracy Saturday. You were able to call up and share with him what you thought that the conspiracies were that were going on in the country. And it was really kind of interesting, people calling up and, all these government conspiracies that are going on. It's like, wow, man. But, but here's the conspiracy I believe in. I, I really believe in this. I believe there is a satanic conspiracy. And that the devil does his best to hinder God's people, and especially when it comes to preaching the gospel. I mean, this is what this is saying here. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is all it takes for people to get saved. They just have to call upon the Lord. But then he starts saying, yeah, but... They're, they're not doing it, and how can they unless somebody's helping them? And, and I believe there's some kind of satanic conspiracy that just plants lies in our head and says, you can't do it, you can't do it. You, if you do it, you'll come across weird. This is for a select group. This is too difficult. You don't know how to do it right. People don't want to hear it. And these are lies. These are lies from the devil. And so I'd like to shoot some holes in this conspiracy, and maybe over the next couple of weeks, let's just look at different stories in the Bible where people uh, share the gospel in evangelistic ways and, and start recognizing that there are different styles of sharing the gospel. There are different methods that you can use to expand the kingdom. 
And so next week we'll look at a couple different styles. We'll talk about like uh, confrontational, uh, uh, talking, spirit, having spiritual discussions with people. Uh, you know, we'll look at uh, different methods that people use. But today I, I want to look at some different styles. I want to look at three different styles. We'll look at three different passages. We'll look at uh, uh, the invitational style. We'll look at the uh, party style. And we'll look at the servant evangelism style. Let's take a look at the invitational style of reaching out to people. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 4. We'll read a story of a lady who used the invitational style to invite people to become part of what God's doing. In John chapter 4, uh, we won't read all the verses, but I'll tell you the story and then we'll read some of the verses. But John chapter 4, the story of Jesus traveling from Jerusalem, heading north. To, this, to the Galilee area. As he's heading north to the Galilee area, he passes through a middle section of Israel called Samaria. Samaria was uh, populated by people who were hated by the Jews. They were sort of considered half-breeds. They had intermarried. They didn't keep their Jewish culture. They followed other gods. So when the Jewish people passed through Samaria, they tried to pass through as quick as they could and tried to have no dealings with Samaritan people. And so as you get into chapter 4, Jesus and the disciples are passing through Samaria. And um, it tells you in verse 5, he comes to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. And now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, be about 12 o'clock. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone into town to buy water. Jesus is sitting there by himself. A lady comes out, and he starts having a conversation with her. doesn't seem weird to us, but that was very weird. Jewish men didn't talk to women, first of all, alone in public, let alone a Samaritan woman. And here's Jesus saying, hey, man, I'm really thirsty. Can I have a drink? And she's all freaked out about this. The woman of Samaria, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink for me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Well, then you read the rest of the chapter, and Jesus starts talking to her about the kingdom of God. And uh, he basically does what we call read her mail. Um, she, she's responding to him, and then he says to her, well, why don't you go call your husband? And she says, I don't have a husband. He said, yeah, you're right. The guy you're living with, you're not married to, and you've had four other guys before that. You know, pretty confrontational there. Uh, and she's going, whoa, I perceive you're a prophet. And he begins to tell her about her life and share with her about the kingdom of God. It's an incredible story here. But as you get through the chapter, uh, it tells you that uh, the, uh, uh, the disciples come back in verse 27. At this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? Then verse 28, then the woman left her water pot went her way into the city and she said to the men, here's the invitation, come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. That's called the invitation. You guys got to meet this Jesus. She didn't feel qualified to explain theology to these people. She didn't feel qualified to explain what all it meant to be the Messiah or the fulfillment of prophecy or what the scriptures said. All she does is tell them, you got to come and meet this guy, Jesus. I mean, he's, he's, the, he's the Messiah. And look at the response. They went. They went out of the city and they came to him. And then it tells you later on that he stayed there for a while and they became followers of Christ. But this is called the invitation. You know, the, the easiest way to be a part of advancing God's kingdom is to use the invitation. It's called inviting people to church. You know, you may not feel comfortable sitting down having a long spiritual discussion with someone about end time prophecies. You may not feel comfortable explaining to someone all the steps of salvation you may not feel comfortable. You may not even feel qualified. That's okay. It would be good if you did. But look, anyone can do this. It's called the invitation. And, and what is incredible, you want to talk about a satanic scheme that's going on. Think about the lies that the devil has put in people's minds when it comes to the invitation. Most of us think if you invite someone... They're going to have these kind of reactions this guy had in the video. Ridiculous. No way. I'm offended. How dare you? 
Well, if you have those lies planted in your head, you might want to, first of all, just do a little research on this because there are numerous studies, numerous surveys, where they survey people and say to them, if someone you knew, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, a relative, if someone you knew invited you to church, how would you respond? 70 to upwards of 83% of the responders said, I would respond positively. I would not be offended. 70 to 80%. Most of us think 90% would be offended. 90% would end their relationship with us. 90% would think we're crazy. Facts are 70 to 80% would respond positively. Here, here's, th th these statistics are shocking. 70% of people who do not go to church, so a huge percentage of our population does not go to church on Sunday. 70% of the people who do not attend church marked on surveys, they had never been invited one time to attend someone's church service. Never been invited. Not once. Never. And most people who come to church for the first time, the overwhelming majority will come because a friend has invited them. It's easy. It's so easy. All you have to do is say, hey, would you be interested in coming to church with me on Sunday? It's that easy. Now, now you know, you can't just run out there and be inviting everybody. I mean, you, you can, but you're probably not going to get great responses. I do think it's worth our time to pray about it and ask God to give us some direction. And to recognize that an invitation is not in itself going to resolve uh, a person's issues as far as salvation. An invitation will get them to come to church, but people will come because they're invited. They stay because they find community. They find connectedness. And so that's probably one of the reasons why some of us don't invite people. We're afraid they are going to come, and then we have to disciple them or be their friend or reach out to them but but really that's what happens people will come because they're invited they'll stay because they're finding community and and in our culture today this is a big deal people will join a church because of community way before they find christ they, there's so much brokenness in our culture. There's so much mobility. There's so much isolation that people are looking for it. They look for it in sport teams. They look for it in uh, bars. They look for it in work clubs. Anything they can do, they're trying to find community. And when you're a part of a church community, you have an opportunity to bring somebody in and say, hey, just come and check it out. And it would be helpful if you're connected because then if you're connected and you know what's going on, you can help them. But, but this is so simple. This is so simple. It's not offensive. It's easy. And it's a, a biblical system that you see here. You'll see it several times throughout the scripture. Just, just inviting someone, knowing that they cannot call upon the Lord unless someone's helping them through the process. I mean, they can. The Bible says your conscience will bring you to Christ. But we know, and the scriptures say, sin deadens the conscience. It becomes difficult to find Christ on your own. It can happen, but most often it happens in community when people are in a relationship and they begin to realize God loves them and God cares for them. So, so the first one is just basic invitational. Let's look at a second one here. It's sort of similar, but it's a little bit different. It's found in the Gospel of Luke. Turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And we'll read a couple of verses here. This is the story of Matthew, who was a tax collector. He was also, also called Levi. And Jesus calls him to be a follower, to become one of his disciples. And so in Luke chapter 5, verse 27, After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, which would be Matthew, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he left all and rose up and followed him. Now, I like verse 29. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. Levi threw a big party. Levi had a big party in his house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. Uh, sinners, lost, unchurched. But the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious people murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with these sinners? 
Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So what, what kind of method you think Matthew or Levi used as far as evangelism? What would we call that? This party. It's a Matthew party method. This is a Matthew party. He has a party. He's thinking, I just met Jesus. He's so awesome. I mean, it looks like he just met him for the first time, but they had had interaction before this. But at this time, he's saying, now, Levi, quit your job. Come follow me. And he does. But he has this big party, invites all of his friends, and he's saying, I want you guys to just rub shoulders with Jesus and his disciples. They're, they're awesome people. I want you to meet them and come and hang out. And he's inviting all these unchurched people. And, of course, the church people are going, that's a little weird, you know. You should be, you shouldn't be so, I mean, that just doesn't. And then Jesus buds in, listen, man, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners, man, the broken, the lost, the unchurched. This is called a Matthew party. Actually, this is a lot of what we do as a church. And I think you could, obviously, you're, you're a part of it when you participate in these things. But we have these things we call big days. We have them almost every month. We don't call them Matthew parties, but we could. I mean, we have uh, the Jazz and Rib Fest. We have the Family Fun Day. We have our Hunter Sunday, Men's Bacon Fest, Women's Spring Tea, Easter Egg Hunt, Christmas Program, Guys Camp Out, Ladies Canoe, Halloween Party. I mean, almost one a month. We have Matthew parties one a month. And the idea, it's similar to this. It's to give people an opportunity to bring your friends so they can rub shoulders with, with Christians and, and maybe begin to realize, oh, there's something missing in my life I'm looking for something that maybe this is it and so these Matthew parties I mean they're just great opportunities our student ministry just had a Matthew party Monday night I mean would you call it a power a flower fest or something it was a hundred students at this Matthew party they had and they brought their friends and it's just an opportunity to rub shoulders it's giving people a chance to see that maybe God is what's missing in their lives. And so this is a simple method of evangelism. I don't even think Matthew or Levi figured it all out. I think this was just natural. He just was so excited. He, he wanted his friends to rub shoulders with Jesus, and it was totally legitimate. And, and this is, again, what we do as a church. And our hope and belief is that whenever we have a big day, you just remember, this is a Matthew party, man. Bring the lost. Bring the unchurched. Bring your coworker. Bring your relative. Bring your neighbor you know, bring, bring someone that is, that is ready to call on the name of the Lord and will if we give them an opportunity, if we reach out. And a Matthew party is so easy. It's not threatening, you know, especially they think, you do that at your church? Yeah, 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 it's okay. The religious people may not like that. That's okay. I stand with Jesus. I didn't come to call the righteous. We came to help those who are lost. And a Matthew party is just a wonderful opportunity I think you can also do these in your own neighborhood. You know, you can have Matthew parties. You can have a cookout. Invite your neighbors. Uh, you can have all kinds of Matthew parties. You know, if you're a mom with young kids, invite the young kids over in the summer. I mean, there's just things you can do where it's, it's an easy opportunity and you have Christians and they're mingling with these unchurched people and it gives them that first step in the door where they can begin to realize God is what's missing in their lives. So the second one we're talking about here is a Matthew party. And then we'll look at one more and then we'll finish up. This one is in the book of Acts. So turn with me if you have your Bible, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And this is a story about a lady, her name is Dorcas, and uh, she had passed away, but there's this description of her that tells us what kind of method she used as far as evangelism. In uh, chapter 9, verse 36, it says, At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples heard Peter was there. They sent two men, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Peter arose, went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter puts them out, prays, raises Tabitha or Dorcas from the dead. Quite, quite a story. But... but just looking at this lady, Tabitha, I, I don't think, I don't know, but I'm going to guess, I don't think she preached sermons. 
I don't, I don't think she was an evangelist. I don't think she passed out literature, tracts. I don't know, but I just would feel like maybe she did. I, I don't know if, you know, she was uh, going around knocking door to door telling people about Jesus. I think she found something that she could connect with and felt like this was her way to be a part of building the kingdom of God. And I, I think maybe this is what's important when you talk about sharing the gospel is just beginning to realize who you are and what you're comfortable with. Dorcas practiced what I would call servant evangelism. Servant evangelism. She just did kind deeds for people. And, and this is so powerful. Again, this is what we do as a church. We have our free clinics that we run. We have, uh, let's see if I, medical clinic, vision clinic, pregnancy clinic, legal clinic, tax preparation, computer repair, bicycle repair, dog obedience. I, I'm passionate about these. We, we also have our, our uh, food pantry. We've got our free wheelchair mission. These are, these are servant evangelism ministries. These are opportunities where we serve people in practical and real ways. And I can tell you that this is a powerful way to share the gospel. We, we have so many cynical people outside the church who are convinced that the church is a ripoff. I mean, if you start talking about church, some people get all upset because their whole idea of church is what they see on TV. They see some TV preacher, and all he's doing is asking for money, and so they think that's what church is about, and they, they're, they're put off by it. But then they hear about your church, and you're saying... No, no, we're here to give. We're here to serve. How can we help you in a real and a practical way? I love these clinics. I love our church because of this. I mean, I'm passionate about this. I mean, if there's anything that I feel like I relate to, that is my style of evangelism. I think servant evangelism is just something I connect with. I just believe that there's a way we can participate in the kingdom of God. And, and especially with this, if you participate in some sort of servant evangelism, either here at the church or again in your own neighborhood or your own workplace, if you just keep your eyes open and, and see somebody in need, can I help them? And you hear somebody's in trouble, can I help them? When you serve people in Jesus' name as a representative of God, as a faith-based ministry, which we tell people our clinics are faith-based, I'm convinced it plants a seed so deep in their heart that the devil himself cannot steal that. There's just no way. He may accuse the church of everything, but they got this seed going, yeah, but those people helped me. Those people were kind to me. Those people served me. There's, there's something different there. So servant evangelism is just, again, another way, but but in summary, I just want to say there are so many different ways you can participate in advancing the kingdom of God. I believe with all my heart that God's Holy Spirit is blowing across this land and we're ready for an awakening. So much. We need so much. But it's not going to happen someplace else. It has to happen in our hearts. It has to happen in our church. And I just encourage you, be a part of advancing the kingdom of God. You don't have to go out and be something you are not. Learn what you're comfortable with. Uh, participate in what God's Holy Spirit is doing. But, but keep an eye out. Keep an eye out for people. I mean, the Bible says we're supposed to have beautiful feet. Beautiful, beautiful feet. You know, just out of curiosity... I just love the website. I did a little search on beautiful feet. That's weird. That's some weird stuff. There are websites that are devoted to beautiful feet. I even came across this one that in the 1970s, some Russian ballet dancer was considered to have the most beautiful feet in the world. Now, I don't know anything about ballet, and I, I, I don't really care about the most beautiful feet in the world. But there are some feet I really am concerned about, and that is the feet of those who declare the good news. I mean, do you really believe that we have good news? Think of what we can tell people. If you open your heart to God, he will forgive you of all your sins, all the guilt that people carry because of bad decisions. It's almost literal. 
it's like weight on their shoulder and you get to tell them you can come to God in the name of Jesus he will forgive you that's good news man people are carrying burdens what about telling people that hunger that's deep inside of your heart that something is missing I mean if people are quiet a lot of times people don't ever like to get quiet we like noise 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 but when people are quiet by themselves they feel that 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 God-shaped hole in their heart and you get to tell them that there's an answer that that if you open your heart to God he'll meet that need and come into your life I mean we have good news we, we really you know people who have no purpose in life no direction nothing when you come into the kingdom of God you at least have a purpose I'm living for God everything I do is under his banner I'm not just wandering through life I'm not just making money buying things spending them getting old and dying that is just empty man but you get to tell someone look there's a purpose for your life I mean we we can have beautiful feet every one of us Maybe not physically, but at least spiritually. Let's pray that God awakens us. Let's close in prayer. God, I thank you that we get to be a part of advancing your kingdom. And God, I pray for our country. It is just a bit overwhelming what is going on every week in the news. But, but I'm not hopeless, God, and I don't believe any of us here are hopeless. We know the answer. We know your ways, your kingdom is the answer. And I, I just pray, Holy Spirit, you stir among us. You, you awaken us to be a part of your kingdom, to begin to realize there are so many people out there who have never been invited to church who would call upon your name if someone could help them. God, I thank you for our church. I thank you that we have a place to invite people, that we have Matthew parties, that we have servant uh, opportunities, that we have community here that we can invite people, friends, neighbors, co-workers, relatives, even strangers, God. Just, let's just take a moment. I, I believe that the Holy Spirit is probably stirring in a couple of you right now and actually bringing the names and faces of some people at work, a neighbor. And you know, you've been thinking about them and thinking how can you witness to them. But I, I just want to pray this morning, God would imprint a name, a face on your heart that we would begin praying for that person praying for an opportunity to reach out and, and do the simplest evangelistic method of all an invitation a sincere invitation just, just stir us right now Holy Spirit we have so much to give we have such good news to offer thank you for those who reached out to us God We're so grateful help us to reach out to others pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up. We'll take our offering. So I just, uh, I just wonder if there's some of you here feeling that same kind of stirring that, that I've been feeling. I, I just get the sense that there's a, a number of us here. I don't know, maybe you've been a Christian for a number of years, but in the past month or so, just feeling like a how to describe it a fresh wind a stirring maybe an awakening or something like that am I, am I talking to some of you raise your hand if you're feeling that same thing I mean I'm, I'm for real here something different something different hold, hold your hand up I, I just want to bless this because I, I feel like there's a fire you know that's a fire and there's a passage where the scriptures say Jesus would would not allow even that flickering flame to go out like he would blow on it I just want to I just want to bless this because I think there's a fire and be so it's just so fun to be a part of God's kingdom and and to be awakened you know every now and then all of a sudden yeah man yeah hold your hand up if you're uh if you're standing next to somebody with their hand up just put your hand on their shoulder let's just bless this let's just blow on this move of God let's see what God does right now just just put your hand on somebody's shoulder if you're standing next to them right now in the name of Jesus father you are stirring hearts here right now God, I just blow on that right now. 
the name of Jesus. Let that flicker start turning into a flame. More. More Holy Spirit. More. Let it burn within us, God. Something different, something new, something fresh. That awakening, clear the fog, God. Give our eyes a different perspective. In the name of Jesus, I bless that, God. Awaken the excitement, the passion. More, more Holy Spirit. Let it be different enough that we would truly notice something is happening in our hearts, God. Let it come out of our mouth. Let it come out at work. Let it come out with our family and friends, God. A passion about your kingdom, God. Awaken it, Lord. Holy Spirit, more of your presence. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Just pour yourself out, God. Fill us. Overflowing. Do I have our prayer team up front here? We're getting ready to close. We're, we're going to close with this last song. Uh, just a couple of thoughts, things stirring in my heart. If you if you need prayer, uh, we want to pray for you this morning. I invite you to come up during this last song. I got a couple of words uh, ringing in my right ear. Somebody get, having some problem ringing in the right ear. Somebody problem with your jaw, trouble chewing, or just like real serious pain in your jaw. So if I'm speaking to you, I just feel like when those happen, those are words of knowledge. Holy Spirit's trying to give you some faith to believe for healing. If you need healing, you need some prayer this morning, we invite you to come up as we close with this last song. As we sang, there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain and to deliver us. All it takes is us surrendering, surrendering our lives to him. So let's sing that. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all to him my freely give and I will live love and trust him in his presence daily live surrender oh. I surrender oh. oh to thee my blessed Savior I surrender oh.
That concludes our service. Thanks so much for coming out. God bless you. If you need prayer, we have people up here ready to pray with you. Have a great week.